Hi, this is Dr. Kate Antonova, Professor of History at the City University of New York, and this is History in Practice. Uh, I would like to point out that in this video, I have got my microphone working properly. I'm sorry if the first few videos had pretty crappy audio. I'm hoping this is better. Uh, the only reason I can do these videos at all is that I had this kind of set up for uh, uh, online college that we did during COVID. Um, and uh, I'm not aiming for professional studio quality here. I, I don't have the time or money to invest in that. Um, so this is what it is. It's basically, you know, online college like we did during COVID. Um, and I'm doing some extra videos and, and opening them to the public um, because I feel like there's frankly kind of a need for it. And I hope to reach people. Um, that's, that's my goal here. Um, if you're really, really need that perfect audio studio, everything, sorry, I'll have to go somewhere else. Um, anyway, doing my best. Okay, so today's topic, is about research. And I know if you're on the internet, as you obviously are, you have heard and been annoyed by the sort of Google research. Uh, people who say, I've done my research, meaning they've done a Google search. Um, obviously that's not really what research is. I'm gonna talk about what research really is. Um, but there's actually a lot of layers to this that we don't tend to get into on social media um, that I think are really important. And it, they should have been covered in your high school education and certainly in your college education, they may not have been. Um, or it may be that you know that was a while ago and, and time has passed and things have changed. So uh, the thing about uh, Google research um, obviously it's inadequate. Obviously it's not really research. Obviously it's gonna get you bad results. However, there is a thing we call Google Foo, which is sort of Google skill. There is a way to actually be more effective at researching things on the internet. And for really basic factual things, it's possible um, to find things out. I wouldn't call it research. I'd call it finding something out, but it is possible to find something out on the internet reasonably effectively. Number one, don't use Google. <laughs> Google has an algorithm that is going to feed you what it thinks you want. And that means it will uh, reinforce your priors. If you already like a lot of content that points in a particular direction, and this is not necessarily political or ideological or religious, whatever, although it will get you those kinds of results if you're, you're clicking on a lot of things that suggest a certain point of view. Um, but just a kind of general types of content is what it's going to point you to whatever you're already using. And of course, Google is also mining virtually everything in your phone. Not everything you say while your phone is on. From what I understand, that's a myth about it's theory, <laughs> how it seems to happen. But literally everything you click on, everything you pause on when you're browsing, um, things people send you in your Gmail account, all of that stuff is being mined usually by Google. And it's, it's pointing you to what it thinks you want um, in advertising, but also in your Google search results. So don't use Google. Uh, DuckDuckGo is one of the sort of non-algorithm search uh, engines you can use. Um, but the other major still be using a search engine is asking the right kind of questions. And that usually means not actually framing it as a question, like, you know, putting into the search box, uh, I don't know, are there more skunks this year? Because I've been noticing a lot of skunks, by the way. Anyway, um, I tried to Google that, I got nothing. Uh, but anyway, and I, I say Googling as if we're using Google, but we shouldn't be using Google. I never use Google as a search tool. Um, but if you're putting into DuckDuckGo, a question with a question mark at the end. Um, you're gonna get the answers everybody else got when they asked that question, which again, is not necessarily the actual best answer. It's usually more effective to use key terms. Um, and sometimes you can do things like specify that you get .edu sites, which could mean you're getting you know, something that's actually sort of research-based, but it could also mean it's just a high school curriculum website type thing that's not necessarily any better. I mean, it could be, but you don't know uh, than anything else. Um, but th there's a whole set of skills, in other words, which you know it's beyond my scope of this video to get into all of that, but you can have better Google Foo or worse Google Foo. The absolute worst kind of Google Foo is to actually use Google to put in a question and believe the things that come up on the first page, which is what the vast majority of people do and what's usually meant by Google research, right? That's not good. It could be a little bit better, but nonetheless, I would call that finding things out on the internet, not research. None of that is research. Um, the thing is, I've seen a lot of um, people who think they're better than that on the internet, um, who will be snide about Google research, who will then present information. And frankly, this is so common on podcasts. It's virtually every podcast that purports to present information you don't already know, um, where they read a book or read a few books. And that's research. And it is way better than Google research, okay? That is absolutely much more than that. And a lot of those podcasts, their job is to provide you with that extra context. They're reading the books so you don't have to, and they give you the highlights, right? And some of them do it very, very well. Um, often they'll also have some kind of expert on. Um, 
some of these, again, do it better than others. One of the podcasts I absolutely love, by the way, is Ologies. Um, it's fantastic and it covers way more than just sort of scientific ologies. Uh, there's great ones about science, but they're, they're on all kinds of amazing subjects. And one of the things that the creator of ologies, uh, Allie Ward, I believe her name is with one L if I'm correct, um, does is find a really great expert on the subject. Now, of course you want to get someone who's personable, who's articulate, who can talk in a podcast without being totally boring. And there were one or two where you can tell she, she didn't pick the right person and she struggles to make them interesting. I actually only remember one like that, but mostly she's a fantastic job and she gets really, really personal people. And the thing I want to tell all of you who are seeking experts on your podcast is that academia is not what you think it is. It's not the old dudes with beards in tweeds that you've seen in the movies who, yes, are usually really boring to listen to. That's how they were taught. Um, most of us, right? I'm a full professor. I've been in this game a long time. Um, I'm Gen X. I say awesome every other word. I don't talk like that. Um, I don't use jargon in speech. Um, sometimes I use it when it's absolutely necessary in writing when defining my terms, right? But I don't talk like that. Most of us in academia do not talk like that. There's lots and lots and lots of people with incredible expertise who are very personable. And the thing is, what we do for a living is talk to students who are the least likely to be super interested, frankly, a lot of times, not all the time, that's unfair. But particularly, you know, we all teach gen ed requirements, for example, classes people don't wanna be in. We are teaching young people, people who are just coming into college and don't yet have a college level vocabulary, they're there to get that college level vocabulary, right? So that's what we do every day. And maybe 30, 40 years ago, which may have been a college experience for many people, um, there was, you know, the sage on the stage, some old dude, there are still some around. Um, and, you know, they may be reading from 30 year old notes. Frankly, I, that's where all my professors were like, um, not all of them, but a lot. Of them. Um, and yeah, I wouldn't want them on a podcast. No. Um, but that is a tiny minority of who's left in academia these days. Um, so we're actually much better at communicating than you think. Um, but anyway, going back to what I was talking about with podcasts is a lot of times the experts in the podcast, um, for most of them, Ologies of being a great exception of really like identifying the right person to talk about a subject. It's like she finds the person and that makes it worth doing a, a podcast on is my guess. I don't know if that's what she does, but that's what it feels like. Um, she gets really great people who are exactly the right person to talk about the, the topic she's got going on. For a lot of other podcasts, including, and I'm not going to name names. Um, I don't want to shame anyone. Um, it's some really popular podcasts that I, I personally love that are great, that are really, really widely listened to. When they have experts on, it's often a kind of rotation of sometimes just a few people, maybe up to a dozen people who kind of go from podcast to podcast as like the expert on history, for example, or royalty or, you know, whatever. And that's kind of their thing. And they do it on all the podcasts. The thing is about historians, I'm going to do another video on uh, historical specialties and how we specialize and sort of what we actually know and what we don't know um, is you don't know that much <laughs> about everything. You don't know anything about everything. And the fact is there are great, personable, articulate people who could be specific to the topic for that day, not just the one you know is reliable, the one you're comfortable with that you've maybe contacted before, or maybe someone you like and you've talked to and, and it went great. And so you want to do it again. You could actually get someone else because what I heard every time I listen to some of these unnamed podcasts when it's actually a subject I do know something about. And mind you, when it's something I don't know about, I'm just like, oh, wow, that's so cool. That's so cool. I'm so grateful for it. Well, then when it's something I do know about, I'm like, oh, ah, no, not, no, no, that's not quite right. Um, no, really not right. Sometimes, you know, I'm nitpicking. That's okay. That's what I do as an academic. It doesn't, you know, it's, there's nothing really wrong with it. But really a lot of the time, almost every time when it's something I really know, it's fundamental errors of basic misunderstanding. And yes, every historian is capable of making fundamental errors of misunderstanding on a topic outside of their area, even sometimes on topics inside your area when you're not actually up to date because you know, you've been working on something else for the last 10 years. It takes about 10 years to write a book. And you know, some stuff's been happening and new things have come out in another area and you haven't heard it yet. So it's not like what you're saying is wrong, but we know so much more and it's so much cooler and it's real and why would we want to miss out on that? Well, you got to find the right person for it. And these days, actually, it's so much easier to find that right person than it's ever been before. Almost every college and university in the country has a whole office in charge of 
sort of connecting the public to the particular expertise of their faculty. And you know what my college does is every single year they ask each one of us to explain, you know, you write in whatever you've published recently um, and what sort of areas you can talk on. Um, I'm also registered, there's a Women Also Know History database um, that is meant to encourage uh, the press, especially, but created documentaries, whatever, to notice that there are women historians, actually majority women in history. Um, yet the talking heads are almost always not just white guys from Ivy Leagues, but literally like the same five white guys, literally the same five white guys. Um, and you, I bet you could name them. I know I can name them. <laughs> I'm not going to. And I'm not saying anything against those guys. And obviously they get called back over and over and over because they're very good at what they do but so are thousands of other people, certainly at least hundreds, <laughs> many hundreds, but I would really say, I think it's thousands. Um, and you can get uh, women, you can get people from other places. I was a talking head once because I wanted so badly for CUNY and women to be represented and it turned out to be a disaster. So I'll, it's for another video, I'll talk about that another time. Um, but it's a lot of work to be done in those areas. In any case, in terms of like podcast guests, a lot of times some of these super popular informative educational podcasts that are you know, doing a great service. And I don't, that's why I'm not naming, I don't wanna put them down. I really enjoy these podcasts and I do think on the whole, they're doing a great, great service. But that kind of research that they do in those podcasts generally involves the host read a few books. Um, sometimes there's one, um, sometimes there's only one to read, that's fine. Um, sometimes they're you know, at most reading two or three at the absolute most that I've heard anyway. Um, and then they'll maybe have a guest who is meant to be the expert and oftentimes is not really even close to the best person to talk about that. And I'm, when I say the best person, I mean, there's two dozen who could do it well. And this is person's kind of outside that circle of, of the two dozen closest um, or a dozen closest, depending on how narrow the specialty is, right? Um, what you get is misinformation. I'm sorry, uh, from podcasts I love, you get misinformation or more commonly, not so much misinformation as fuzzy information that is a little bit misleading or is a little bit um, kind of takes the wrong basic assumptions and then throws in some real facts and it becomes this kind of soup of iffiness when what was possible, what was totally possible with some real research that done right wouldn't necessarily take much more time than what they're doing. Okay, a little bit more time, but not much more time. Um, is to do real research and end up with something truly great. And the, the example of ologies is it. I would, I'm completely satisfied with that. Ologies does a fantastic job of this. So it is absolutely possible. Um, obviously, a lot of pod podcast hosts are, you know, barely scraping by. So support your podcasters who you love, right? I do. You should. They they deserve a living wage like everyone else. And the more they're able to be supported, the more able they are likely to do real research. So what do I mean by real research? Let's back up a little bit. Um, there are three terms that you're probably going to hate because it's probably going to bring back bad memories from whatever schooling you've had most recently. They're really, really important to actually understanding what real research is as opposed to internet bullshit. Um, so primary, secondary, tertiary. Sorry, but I got to say it. Primary sources, secondary sources, tertiary sources. I'm sure at some point this has been talked about. Um, I actually know for a fact because I um, have done the training for composition studies, which is the study of how to write, that freshman comp or your first semester freshman how to write class, that anyone who's been through college from the late 90s to the present would have probably had to take. Um, that class explicitly tries to avoid getting into primary versus secondary. They just talk about how to use quotations and so on. Uh, I have huge issues with that, huge issues with that. But it's okay because that's freshman comp at the starting class. What we're really supposed to do is not quibble with that. And I don't really um, just have feelings, uh, but to build on it in the other disciplines. And that's a big part of what I do in my teaching, for example. So when you're going beyond freshman comp to study any particular discipline, when you're taking courses in a particular discipline, whether it's biology or mathematics or computer science or art history or history or whatever, political science, any, any of them, you will start to build on the research skills and the um, the kinds of distinctions in sources that are important to that particular discipline. Um, in all disciplines, there is a difference between primary, secondary, and tertiary that's really important. Some disciplines don't use the term so much, and in some disciplines, sort of the way you do research is structured that college level research and beyond anyway, you only get a certain kind of sources. You would never look anywhere else. And it's just kind of a hard rule, and therefore you don't need to obsess about whether it's primary, secondary, or tertiary because you're frankly being constricted to only primary 
um, or in some cases where, where secondary is, is sort of the only thing appropriate, you would just, but for this question, we do this, right? It's just kind of rules. You don't need to kind of understand the theory behind it. This is the theory behind it. Uh, in history, because we study everything, literally anything that's happened up to now, right? That's what historians study. We can use any kind of sources. Um, for us, we really need that <laughs> guidance of theory because there's so much open-endedness to, to what we can study. And I mean, literally what kinds of things you pick up to study to base your research on, right? Um, so we need uh, to talk a lot about primary, secondary, tertiary and should frankly talk about it more than we do. And to the extent it is talked about in history discipline, it tends to be sort of just the difference between primary and secondary. Primary is anything written at the time you're studying, right? Then something from the past is your primary source. That's your evidence. The secondary things are things that historians wrote. So these are analyses. This is the historiography, we call it, which is the, the people who studied this history already. And you are studying the primary sources. That is your evidence. You want to draw your conclusions from the evidence, but you're going to situate them within the, the questions uh, already formed by the literature, right, that are already out there. That's your basic basic outline. That's probably as far as anyone gets in the undergraduate level. However, let's take a step further back even from that. Let's think about first, students often have issues with the language of primary, secondary, tertiary because first, second, third, primary, secondary, tertiary could apply in so many different ways. A lot of students who come, particularly who come to say my college without having had secondary education in the United States, coming from all over the world sometimes, um, they would very naturally think primary means most important, um, it's the stuff you're most using, right? Um, and sort of secondary and tertiary are things that are, are just sort of background or contextual or something. That's a very logical conclusion to jump to about what those words must mean. Totally not what they actually mean, um, but it's very logical. There's a lot of other ways to interpret first, second, third, right? It can mean a lot of different things. Um, so you really have to actually understand why these words are used in this way in the context of research. Um, so what we mean by primary first, right, is the uh, evidence in its purest state. The pure evidence could be a text written in the past, right? Or anything else that's coming from the past. It is the piece of evidence from the past. Primary uh, sources also include data, um, experimentation if we're doing science, right? Um, if you're thinking of evidence in say a courtroom setting, the evidence are the testimonies of witnesses, the weapon, right? The forensics, those, that's evidence. That's what we mean by primary. That's the first thing. It's the thing that is the, the relic, right? The evidence, what's left from whatever it is we're studying, whether it's a crime or a historical event or uh, you know, a, a scientific phenomenon. Um, it is what exists that can give us any clues. You could just say it's clues. Primary sources are clues. Clues about whatever it is we're studying. Once we start studying it, once we're looking at those clues and thinking things about it, what we're thinking about it, that's now secondary. See how that's one layer past the first. The first is the original clues uh, that give us something left of the problem to go on to understand it. Once we're trying to understand it, our understanding of it is the second layer, our trying to interpret, to analyze, to explain what we're seeing. All of that is secondary to the original evidence, right? The original evidence is primary, it's the first thing. Secondarily to that, we talk about it and we try to understand it. If we write that down, that's a secondary source, right? Then tertiary is a whole other layer removed where another person, it could be me, but some other person come in and look at all the secondary stuff, look at all the interpretation, all of the different ways people have described the evidence. Then they summarize that. That's, you see, a third layer removed. So if, you know, the, the objects on my desk here are evidence, of whatever happens in this room. The objects on the desk are the evidence. They're the primary sources. When I look at the stuff on the desk and say, well, this looks like a workplace. Uh, it's gotta be late 20th, early 21st century because it's very digital. Um, someone does work here and they're using these particular tools. If I look really closely at these tools, I'm gonna be able to date it pretty accurately, right? If I look at the files on the computer, I can figure out what the person's working on. That evidence, is the primary sources, me interpreting it and saying, well, this must be the date. I'm, I'm drawing from this inference of the date. And it may not be exact, right? Because how old is this computer that I'm still using, right? Years after it came out. Um, I, my interpretation of that evidence is then the secondary source. Someone else or me a few years later comes back and looks at my interpretation of this evidence and probably what we're most likely gonna do is look at other people's interpretation of the same evidence or other people's interpretation of similar evidence. Let's say lots of people studying and trying to draw conclusions from lots of different workplaces. 
we put that all together and write kind of a narrative overview or a reference list of everything everyone found, or just a summary, a basic plain language summary. Any of those things would be tertiary, even though they can take lots of different forms, like a reference work or a summary or an overview. Those are different forms of writing that's different kinds of information for different purposes, but they're all tertiary because they're all the third layer removed. First layer is the pure evidence itself. Second layer is interpretation or understanding or explanation of that evidence. Third layer is taking those explanations or interpretations or analyses and doing something with them. That's tertiary. Okay, so now that we know what primary, secondary, and tertiary are going to do or what they're for, I'm going to explain why so much of this, what I sort of call podcast research, is still really not research, even though it's way better than Google, right? Reading a few books, what you're doing is tertiary. Uh, tertiary sources, typical tertiary sources are encyclopedias, uh, textbooks, uh, any kind of summary. Uh, if you think about it in movie terms, right? Um, a film itself, the work of art is a primary source. Once a critic writes a review of it, the critic is the secondary source. And if you think about a book you can buy, like we used to, before the internet, when you had, everybody had this on their phone, we used to have a book on our shelf. When I was a kid, um, there was this huge thick book uh, that contained the basic information and reviews, like excerpts of lots of reviews of like every movie made. We loved it. It seems super cool at the time. This was before IMDb. <laughs> anyway, that's a tertiary source, right? It's some kind of reference or overview. And of course, if you've all been in school, you've all used a textbook. That's a, a tertiary source as well. Um, so what you get when a podcast host studies a subject or researches it is what they say often, and they read a few books. What are those books they're reading? The books they're reading are secondary sources. Uh, they're not going to an archive. They're not usually interviewing the original, getting witnesses or testimonials or you know whoever was actually involved in whatever it is they're studying. They're not interviewing those people directly. They're reading a book. Where'd that book come from? That book is a secondary source. Someone wrote that book, right? A lot of times, particularly history books, our culture kind of acts like they just appear by magic. And those books on the shelf tell you what the past was. Did you want to, do you want to know what something happened in the past? Read a book that tells you what happened in the past. Um, and then you know what happened in the past. A lot of people think anyone can do historical research because you just go read what happened. And yeah, maybe Wikipedia isn't as good as reading the published book from the bookstore. And so the high level of research that a podcaster might do is go read the published book. Woohoo, hot stuff, right? Where do you think that book comes from? That book is not an actual recording of the past. We often treat it that way. If it were a recording, like a, an actual recording of the lived full infinite universe of the past world, that would be a primary source, but such things sadly do not exist, right? We don't have a time machine. We can't go back and actually live through an event in the past. That book you're getting is not a primary source. It is not the past itself. It is not the closest thing we have to a recording of the past itself. It's not even that. It's just a secondary source. It's somebody's interpretation of the past. Who's the somebody? Somebody's a historian. People like me, I've written books. Other people write books. We all write books. That's what we do. It's part of our job. There are thousands of us out here. We can talk. We talk for a living. We explain things for a living. Uh, we can even go on podcasts. I'm not like trying to push to go be on podcasts. I've been on a couple, a couple of bad experiences as well. I'm not, you know, super pro or con. Um, what I want are good podcasts to listen to where I can actually hear someone who really knows what they're talking about. Um, and I'll give you some recommendations of the good stuff at the end here. Um, but what you're doing when you just go read a history book is you're not learning what happened. Lots of journalists, lots of podcasters, lots of people in lots of fields think they are doing historical research by which they mean finding out what happened in the past. That's not what historical research is at all. Um, I'm going to get to that. <laughs> but they think anyone can find out what happened in the past. And the way that you do that is you go read books about what happened in the past. That is two distinct levels of massive fundamental misunderstanding of all of it. <laughs> um, so first thing is you can't find out what happened in the past. None of us can. Short of a time travel machine, we're not finding out what happened in the past. That is to go into the project as if that is a achievable goal is fundamentally misthinking <laughs> the whole thing. You really got to shift your basic thinking about what the past actually is and to what degree it's accessible, how we access it to the degree we access it, what we use it for. Um, and you could pick up my book, write a book on this, you can listen to this podcast. I'm hoping this is why I'm doing this. 
to try to influence our public misunderstanding of history is so huge, so fundamental, and has really, really real world, world impacts, not just on, you know, whether our podcasts are, are as good as they could be, which is kind of what I'm focusing on here to keep it light, but is real world Im impacts on all kinds of things, um, textbooks in schools, major public issue, um, our understanding of events, of everything. Uh, we rely on what we think is knowable about the past. We rely on what we think we do know about the past. We rely on what we uh, think that past is useful for. And all of it, frankly, is a little off, a little off from reality. Um, so I'm trying, and it's going to take me many, many, many videos, I think, to, to try to re-educate. Um, and of course, the other way to re-educate yourself on this is be a history major anywhere. That, that's what we do. That's the value of a history major is, is to do this in a much more thorough way. But not everybody's going to be a history major. Not everybody should be a history major, obviously. So I'm trying to, to uh, do what I can here. Right? Okay, so back to the problem with secondary sources as the research for, say, a podcast on a subject. Um, and why it's not really research. So if you read a couple of secondary books, what you're doing is you're getting the interpretation of a couple of historians. And actually, the books most people read for these purposes are not written by historians at all. They're written by journalists or sort of biographers or, you know, somebody who's sort of professionally writes about the past. Um, some of those people are you know, doing amazing work. Um, and I have a number of very favorite uh, sort of popular history writers who are not PhD historians. Um, I mean, that's how I be, got into this was because I love those kinds of books and I read lots of those kinds of books and I still read lots of those kinds of books. By the way, absolute number one favorite, Hallie Rubenholz, The Five. Amazing um, and fantastic research. And she does have historical training and boy, does it show. Um, the thing is, I don't want to sort of say, oh, if you don't have historical training, you can't do this. No, I'm not trying to say that. I'm just saying historical training does actually add value. It is a thing. It's not just like, bonus. It's not frills. It's not just a credential. It's actual skills that make an actual difference in doing better work. That it's that's what training is for, right? Um, it's really interesting and telling about our culture and our society that we sort of blow that off. Like, oh, well, anybody can do it. And we do this especially about history because our cultural understanding is that the past as it was is accessible, which is completely and utterly false past is gone. Nobody living it understood it at the time. <laughs> and we certainly can't bring back a full, accurate understanding. Now, the past, just like this moment we're living in today, is infinite, right? Look at the moment we're living in today. And I don't just mean like what's happening in the news right now. I mean, everything, daily life, cultural mores, sensibilities, worldviews, all these kinds of things are words historians, things historians study, right? In addition to, say, politics, world events, climate change, whatever, all that stuff, right? The infinity of our present, which means everybody's perspectives, everybody's perception. How well do you even know yourself and your personal experience? None of us do. We don't. Think about it. How much do you know yourself? Now add everyone else. Just at this moment, we're only looking at one moment. How much do you understand? Fucking nothing, right? Nothing. I mean, this is ridiculous. This is infinity we're talking about. We can't possibly understand it. Well, guess what? The past is that infinity for every moment in all of the existence of humanity. Of course, we can't recreate the past. That's ridiculous. It's just ridiculous to think the past is accessible. All we can do is identify evidence, and we have a teeny tiny, teeny infinitesimal fraction of evidence left of what actually happened, even from yesterday, let alone 500 years ago or 100 years ago. We can take the evidence, we can try to understand it, we can try to apply that understanding in some way that's useful to us now. That's all we're actually doing. We have evidence from the past. We have ways of trying to understand it, some more accurate than others, some more rigorous than others, some more useful than others, and none of those things necessarily coincide. Uh, Every single way we interpret that evidence is of course gonna be full of bias because it's impossible not to. Uh, we are looking at it for our reasons. That itself is basic bias, but not in a bad way. Why else would we look at it? Of course it's for our reasons, right? Question is, can we make it useful to us? Um, historians tend to rather obsess about it being accurate. You can tell I'm one of those people, right? 
obsessed about being accurate. And of course, I firmly believe, and most historians, I'm sure, would, would agree that the more accurate it is, the more useful it's going to be. And so we want to be as accurate as possible. We want as much evidence as possible. We want to read that evidence as clearly as possible. But fundamentally, you must understand we're getting nowhere near actual recording of the past. The idea of, you know, making the past alive. Well, I'm absolutely all in favor of, you know, museums and courses. And certainly my own writing and teaching very much tries to bring to life the, the humanity of people who lived in the past who may feel old timey to us, who may seem different and foreign because they lived in very different circumstances sometimes. I try to make that real and, and sort of put us in the shoes of those people, right? Of course, but we're not actually gonna achieve that, you realize, right? It's not actually possible. Um, so we have to start in with the correct assumption that what we're doing when we do historical research is we are not finding out what happened in the past. That is not a possible thing. And so it's not a question of whether you looked at Wikipedia or something better like a published book. That's not relevant. <laughs> We can't go find out what happened in the past. The way we can find out, you know, find out the day Hitler was born and the day he came to power. You can go look up those dates. You can look them up anywhere in Wikipedia. It's totally fine for that. You can get those dates, right? But that is not the past itself. Um, if we want to understand the past in order to build some story, which is what we do with it, right? To just enrich ourselves, to enrich our understanding of the universe and of humanity, maybe to apply that thinking to something present, um, although that's not strictly necessary to still be enriched by, right? But um, if that's what we're doing, we're building narratives. You have to understand that that's a process of building narratives. It's not finding out what happened. It's a process of building narratives from evidence. So if you go and read a couple of books on the shelf, you're skipping the evidence part and you're just reading a couple of constructed narratives. It, that can be fine if you're doing it, knowing that that's what you're doing. But what I see and hear and the results that come from it that I know because I do the real kind of research all the time is very, very far, far, far from satisfying um, from what it could be. Uh, not because we can really know everything, but because we can know so much more than what we're actually getting to with a lot of this kind of half-assed research. Um, is your, if you go say, I'm gonna find out what happened, you read a couple of books and now you think you know what happened. And reading more than one book, which is really good, and the best podcast will make sure they read two books or three that you know have different perspectives and they'll be self-aware enough to notice they're doing that. What they're gonna do is they're gonna zero in on the, the points of contrast between different interpretations. And a lot of times there'll be sort of really obvious points of view imposed by the author of those two or three books, right? And you can sort of put them in conflict with each other and, and that can lead to a really great discussion. And that, that is part of what research does part of what secondary research does. Um, but the problem I have with a lot of these podcasts, they think they're finding out what happened and telling you what happened by reading these couple of books. And maybe they'll problematize it by looking at the conflict over a couple of key questions from one author to another. Um, they're not noticing that they're completely bypassing primary evidence. Um, they're often not even aware of primary evidence because they're reading these narratives as what happened rather than as a constructed narrative. Um, and I can tell that they're doing that because that's how they talk about it when, when they're describing what they found, right? They're reading it as a narrative of what happened. None of these are narratives of what happened because nobody knows what happened. Even if it's, uh, you know, the closest thing, a primary source, like a diary of someone explaining in private, not intending anyone to see it, you know, they plan on burning it so they have no reason to be dishonest. They write down what happened in the moment that it's happening. Number one, if you're reading that, that's primary source research and that's much better than going and reading the secondary source on it. Um, but even that, that's the sort of ideal scenario. It's very rarely available by the way. But in the absolute ideal scenario, you're reading a primary source written by the person at the center of the thing you're interested in. They're writing it totally in private with no reason to lie or, or, or sort of you know, narrativize it for, for any kind of audience. That is the best you can get. It's still gonna be incredibly inadequate. You know what happens a lot of times when you get those, the best kinds of primary source narratives from the person at the center of things? They talk about the weather. That's what most people do. Um, so if you're keeping a diary, by the way, please talk about something of these guys, the weather. Um, <laughs> not that weather is an interesting climate scientist can use those uh, narratives of weather in the past over time. It's actually very useful, but for the rest of us, <laughs> not so interesting, right? Um, so I work in those kinds of primary sources all the time. The most ideal ones are still wildly inadequate to actually knowing what happened in all kinds of ways. And what my training, my you know, 10 years of postgraduate training was about is how to read even those ideal sources need a lot of very kind of rigorous and um, 
formalized systemic ways of approaching the material of systemic sort of ways of asking questions to make sure you're reading it as well as you can read it and you're still gonna get a very partial read out of it. When I do that kind of thing and then I write it down, my book on that um, is then read maybe by a podcaster, right? That podcaster then can read the book and this has happened. And yes, podcasters are very well meaning they do a great job. They read the book, they understand the book. That's great. The problem, the only problem I have with that is they're thinking now I know what happened. When what they should be thinking is here's a narrative argument. It is narrative, it's usually, most history books are written in chronological order. It'd be hopelessly confusing, they're not. Every once in a while they can be thematic, but usually not. Written in chronological order. There's a lot of who did what when. Um, it sounds like a story. We often work very hard to make it more like a story than it was presented to us, believe me, in the primary sources to make it coherent and make it understandable. But we are always constructing that narrative to make an argument um, because a historical argument, which is about cause and effect uh, over time in the past, um, in order to say what caused X, whatever thing we're interested in, right? What caused this thing? That's a historical question. Well, so-and-so thought this because of this is what the information was available to him. And these were the constraints that he's working on. And this is the culture that he lives in. And because all of these things are going on and these are his several options and this is the way he thinks about things and this is the way he sees the world, then he chose this, which had this effect, which then caused this other thing. That's how causation works, right? Is there are many, many factors all at play. There are constrictions, context that will determine how much people can know and what kinds of choices they're willing to make or able to make. And then there's the individual factors of identity and perspective and intelligence even, or you know, willfulness, um, various kinds of personal motivations that also affect how people behave. And then of course, there's not just one person behaving, they're behaving in a context of other people all behaving at the same time. So in order to make that argument about what caused X, we need to explain all these things that happen. And that's gonna sound like a story. But the story is constructed in order to show you it happened this way. And you can read another historian's narrative of the exact same thing, and it may seem mostly the same. And so you may think, yes, this is what happened, and maybe zero in on one clear bit of, of conflict or argument between them. And you'd be, yeah, mostly accurate. But if you're going in thinking this is what happened, and there's one thing we don't fully know that they argue about, you're missing the bigger picture of how research works and how reality works and how evidence works because none of this is actual reporting and what happened in the past. And I think a big, big, big part of why this is so fundamentally misunderstood is that a lot of the history people read, a lot of the history that you get in articles on the internet, the sort of short form history, a lot of the history in, in a lot of popular literature, a lot of history that informs a lot of public media that we see is written by journalists with journalist training and a lot of podcasters have journalist training. Journalist training is also real valuable training, but it's completely different from historical training. So let me get into that for a little bit. So journalist training, and I have not been to J school. So, you know, journalists feel free to tell me where I get this wrong. But um, from the point of view of the goals of journalism, which is to report, they use the word report, not research, generally speaking, um, for most of the sort of primary goal of what they do, they're reporting on something that's happening right now, right? That's the whole idea of journalism. You're reporting on something that happens right now. So what are the skills you need to have to report on something that's happening right now. You generally wanna interview people as close to the moment as possible. Um, you're gonna interview people because they're involved and it's all happening right here. They're not dead and buried, right? Like my people are, they're, they're right here. So you can talk to them. You get really direct evidence from them. Now, hopefully you, you don't take it as uh, direct evidence of exactly what happened, right? And journalists are trained. Uh, they also have their very rigorous methods, how to ask questions and how to hear those questions in a way that does not just assume everything you're being told is true, right? Of course, that's some of their really important methodology. Um, you're also gonna do research uh, from a journalistic point of view of doing things like looking up documents that uh, will support uh, or, or often refute what you're being told by various people, right? That's also research. Those kinds of documents are generally, I mean, sometimes they're, they're inaccessible, they're classified, whatever. Sometimes you have to do a FOIA request to get them, but a lot of times it, it's just right up there, right? And because it's current and happening right now, the issue is not so much having only fragments of what existed, but whether stuff it, you're allowed to get to it or not. If it's happening right now, usually there's lots of documentation. Anytime from the 20th century to the present, you're gonna get lots of documentation of something happening right now in the moment, but you might not be able to get to it because people, you know, it's their own private material and they don't want anybody to see it or it's 
you know, owned by a government or a corporation or whatever, and they're not going to release it to the public. So that's your big dilemma. And that's where journalists, uh, a lot of their sort of techniques and methods and things that they get trained on is how to get at that stuff that they, people don't want you to get. At. That's a whole important skill. Um, most historians don't need it, although frankly, those of us who work in Russian archives, big part of what we do too, just different contexts, different ways of getting at it. Um, but uh, that that's where your focus is gonna be, right? So when journalists decide, well, I'm good at research, I'm good at understanding, you know, working through questions and trying to find out answers, particularly against people who don't want you to know those answers, which is a really important skill, really difficult skill. That means I'm good at research, right? And the past is there laying out here somewhere, we can just go get it. So I'm a good researcher, I'm going to go find out the past. And what they'll think is I'm going to go read a couple of books, and I'm going to understand those books through my lens of my journalistic research, with a very skeptical eye, and that's great. It's great. Um, maybe you're going to go look up, you know, some records in an archive, even to, to get some original documentation that's primary source research, that's really good. Um, you would maybe read accounts, like letters, diaries, whatever, from people from the past, like you would interview someone who is living today. Um, and lots and lots of journalists have written lots and lots of biographies um, to during using those exact methods. And yes, they're doing history in a way. And I love a lot of those books and a lot of them are very well done. I'm gonna give you a little anecdote to really get at the difference though. So I went one time to a, a great talk at a, a wonderful place called the Leon Levy Center for Biography at the City University of New York, fantastic place. Uh, they have money to support people to write biographies. And every year they give out sort of fellowships to give people the time to work on a biography, usually about a year of funding. And most of the people who get those are journalists um, or sort of professional biographers, whether they you know, have a journalism background or not, and some, some don't. And so they're, they're just you know, sort of took this on by themselves. Um, and some people can, can self-learn this very easily. Some people, not so much, they don't know what they're missing. Um, but, uh, and a lot of people in journalism, and they actually push really hard to get faculty to even apply. And they don't have that many academics doing it. Um, biography is, is a little bit not frowned upon, but a little out of fashion for, for academic historians. Most biography is sort of falls under, it would be a historian doing if any academic is going to do it usually. Um, and uh, we tend to look at biography as, well, the whole point of biography is to tell the story of a life. The story of a life does not answer a question of general interest about cause and effect. Um, so you might use people's lives a lot in your research. I do primarily. Um, but your for one thing, looking at more than one person, and you're not looking at their entire life beginning to end because you're trying to answer some other question, right? Um, so anyway, uh, I went to this panel and there was one historian there, a very famous historian, Alice Kessler Harris, who does fantastic work on the history of women and labor. I actually studied with her. She was on my dissertation committee at Columbia um, and she's part of why I wanted to go to this. Uh, she wrote an amazing biography of Lillian Hellman. And then there were other people um, on the panel. I think there were four people and, um, the other three were all journalists and they all sort of talked about their process, um, you know, how they use their funding and, and how the book went and, and what they gained out of it. And so on. it was really interesting. And one of the best parts was when they all, somebody said how great it feels to get towards the person finally dying and they all laughed this very real laugh. Uh, that was funny. Um, but anyway, at one point, this sort of fundamental conflict in the way the academic, as Kessler Harris and the three journalists were thinking came to a head. And, and became clear. And, it, and then Alice Kessler Harris just said it out loud. Um, the journalists were all using the time and place, the historical context, right? The time and place around the person they were writing about to, they would look up stuff about the time and place to understand the perspective of their person. And you can do that really well. Some people don't do it so well, but most people and certainly everyone on this panel was doing it extraordinarily well to understand this fascinating life, right? Alice Kessler Harris got the fellowship and was there because she had chosen to write a biography about a famous person, which is not that usual for historians. And it's not a coincidence that she's incredibly high status senior historian can write whatever the hell she feels like, right? Um, so she, it's often only at that stage of career that a historian will even do something like write a biography because it's seen as a little bit frivolous. Um, not in the sense that you know it, it's not important or, or cannot be well done, but because it doesn't answer major questions of cause and effect over time, such as, you know, uh, what has been the role of labor in American history, which is one of the questions Alice Cassiris has written really important books on, right? Um, and women in labor specifically. Um, those are the kinds of questions we're generally interested in. So a biography of one single person is just like one data point about those kinds of questions. So it just doesn't seem sort of worth doing. Um, 
what she then explained and her sort of purpose in writing this biography was exactly the opposite of what all the journalists were doing. Yes, she's writing a life of a fascinating person who had you know, a wacky, crazy life. Most biographies, we want to read a biography because the life is amazing, right? So most biographies are written about exceptional people. Historians are generally not so much interested in exceptional people. We want to study the ordinary people who are most people because they're driving most events. They're, they're what history is made out of, right? It's most of us. Um, and I actually applied for a Leon Levy Fellowship, which I did not get, partly because I wanted to write a collective biography of several people and nobody had ever heard of any of them. Um, so nope, it's not going to work for a biography, right? It, it's historical work. I'm just looking for money anywhere. <laughs> money, that was not, not a good avenue. Um, anyway, so what Alice Kessler Harris said is that she chose to write about Lillian Hellman to understand the context of women and work that Lillian Hellman's life could shed light on. That's a historical project. The journalists all, when she said this, were like, why would you do that? What? Huh? Meanwhile, when the journalists were talking about looking up things about the context to better understand you know, this person's decision or experience of something, Alice Kessler Harris and I were going, uh, what, what? <laughs> why would you even bother? That's the fundamental disconnect that I'm talking about um, from a, academic research perspective where we are producing the books that you go read. And our books, by the way, mostly aren't at Barnes and Noble. Barnes and Noble, these days you can get them at Amazon, which is very usual. They're usually priced just way out of anybody's normal budget. So academic books get from an academic library. They don't have it requested and they can get it. Usually other library budgets are really stretched now too. Um, but uh, uh, academic books, which are largely even inaccessible, they're based on the primary research. Often what you'll get at Barnes and Noble is a tertiary book where a journalist read one or two academic books based on, the, those were based on the evidence. The journalist read the secondary layer and then they rewrite it in some readable, more exciting way for a general public. Um, the thing is, while I am all for readable and exciting, and I think there's a very important place for that. Um, and some academics do that themselves and some people without the academic background are doing it and, and both can do it really, really well. And that, that's the, the stuff I read most. I love that stuff. Um, the thing is they're missing a lot in all those layers because it's tertiary, it's two layers removed from the original. Inevitably, you're gonna be missing a lot there. You're gonna miss not just facts, you're gonna miss all the really important nuances of understanding. Um, that makes something real and truly useful. Uh, and if you're aware of those layers, you can look for what you're missing and often find it. And a lot of the best popular history, a lot of the best historical work done by journalists does do that. Unfortunately, the majority that I see aren't aware of what they're missing. And I've seen, again, I won't name names, but I've seen there was a, an introduction to a popular work of history written by a journalist um, that uh, said, I mean, you know, paraphrasing, of course, but it said that um, some historical work that was by an actual historian, a secondary source that they used as the basis, primary basis for their work, they were more or less just rewriting this historian, um, that the historian sort of said in their book that they deliberately didn't apply it to the present because that's inappropriate. And this journalistic author was like, well, what's the point if you can't apply it to the present? Um, so I'm gonna, you know, and all of that's fine. That is kind of the purpose of journalism in, in that context when they're doing that kind of thing and, and I'm all for it. Um, they can do it in a way that a historian can't. But what was missing was this uh, journalist writer's awareness of number one, the historian was not saying history is useless and applies to nothing. Hello, we spend our lives on these. Of course, we don't think that. <laughs> she missed the point utterly of what was being said. What was actually being said is this historian was trying to distinguish a past event because of very important real differences from what's happening now. That does not mean you can't apply it in useful and interesting ways. Uh, you absolutely can and should, but you're supposed to do that as the reader and the journalist rewriting it, absolutely. It's their job, not the historian's job. And they should do it realizing the distinctions. That's what the historian was trying to say. This journalist not only missed that, but took it to mean the exact opposite of what it actually meant. And frankly, her application of this historical material to the present was all kinds of wrong, all kinds of wrong, because she missed exactly the important distinctions. 
uh, that that's when I get appalled, right? And I see it happening, um, you know, occasionally in popular history. Actually, most popular history is much better than that. Um, although, well, it depends. There are levels and genres and so on. But when I see it constantly is social media and absolutely constantly in the kind of articles that a lot of us, frankly, only read the headline, maybe read the article. What we're talking about, you know, Slate, Vox, all the kind of these popular periodicals that produce lots and lots of content that is trying to say something relevant. It's a take. Uh, what social media produces are takes. What our mass media, that's sort of what journalism is today, are, is producing takes. It's a take machine. A take is not what a historian is doing at all. Uh, what a historian is doing is researching, starting from primary sources, um, following a very strict methodology that takes years of training to do well, um, to make the most out of that evidence in an accurate and ethical, transparent way, and then to confront uh, that work, uh, have that work confronted by a lot of other people who are also experts, who also have that background, who've also looked at similar sources, to get to the best thing we can do. That is a very long process. As I said, it takes about 10 years to write a book. Um, five to 10 years, uh, but for a serious work of, of based on primary research, really 10 years, uh, it's a very long process. Uh, it is only possible if you are have a, a position where you're uh, paid a salary and you're frankly still doing the research on your own time, as I've explained in other videos. Um, that is not really something a journalist, I mean, a journalist can't make a living that way. Um, they're producing takes, which are much quicker. The research that they're based on is usually based on looking up a few things and they think they're doing it really well if they don't look it up on Wikipedia like everybody else does and look it up in a published book and that that is better. Um, I can have a whole other video on Wikipedia which is actually useful for a lot of things but you need to know what it's useful for what it's not useful for. Um, and journalists know that um, and they're looking things up in something better but they're looking things up to state as fact something for an immediate purpose that is about what we're doing today and it's about feeding a take which is often about getting clicks and sounding clever. Now that is not what journalism as a profession is supposed to be about. It's not what journalism as uh, training teaches people to do. The real journalists have all been fired. <laughs> uh, real journalism costs money. Real journalism requires people to pay for, for what they produce. Um, and real journalism is not always gonna get clicks. Sometimes it's telling us what we didn't wanna know and we're gonna be pissed off about that and not wanna pay for it so we don't get clicks. They can't survive that way. Uh, since mass media was, uh, you know, there was an FCC decision, I believe, in the 1980s, early 1980s, um, that, that basically made news have to be so self-sustaining, no longer subsidized. And so they have to make a profit. Um, and now they're increasingly owned by giant corporations that have been merged into giant corporations. And so they really want a profit for the shareholders. And so media has become clickbait. Uh, the best journalists who do the really great, great work, largely fired. <laughs> um, there are still people doing great work. I love ProPublica. They do really real investigative journalism. It's very real research, different kind of research because it's about present day things than the kind of research a historian does. But I would say they're absolutely equatable in the sense of really rigorous research requiring lots of training. People, there are people who can do that. There are a lot of people who maybe have those skills and they're being completely wasted because the only way they can make a living in journalism is to turn out endless takes. And those takes are crap. Um, unfortunately, a lot of podcasts are often those journalists trying desperately to make a living, turning out more takes. Um, and yes, they are doing a service because they're doing more than the average person on social media who does only look up things in Wikipedia or not even that. Frankly, most of them not even doing that. Uh, they're not reading past headlines. And so their takes are even worse, right? And so to go to a sort of paid source for a trained journalist to get a better take, definitely a step up. It's what I do. What else can we do? There's not much else out there. And you can't wait 10 years <laughs> to get you know, the really full in-depth. And a lot of times on most subjects that I'm only you know, casually interested in, I don't want to go that deep. I want the take. I just want a better take than most takes. And, and there's a place for that. And there's a lot of people doing it. But we need to notice the difference between a take and an evidence-based argument or a research-based argument. That's going to give us a lot more. And it's going to be a lot more accurate. And it's going to have the nuances that are real, whether we like them or not. Um, so to do good research, in other words, is not just reading a couple of secondary works. It's not, and let me emphasize this, going and just interviewing the person who wrote the book. A lot of journalists who sort of see an inadequacy there will go and just interview the person who wrote the book. Everything I know, I put in the book. <laughs> so I'm not going to have a lot more to say. I mean, I'm happy to talk about it and I have done any research about my book and I'm happy to do more, uh, happy to, you know, convey to an audience 
in a quicker, lighter way what, what they might be interested in from the book. I'm always happy to do that. I'll do some of that on this channel. Um, and that's fine. I'm not saying don't interview the author, but that's not an extra layer of research. That's just popularizing or reaching a new audience with that research. It's not actually doing research to go interview the author. Um, what the author did was put it all down in the book. And what you do is you read that book really critically, but the major, major difference between reading a few books on a subject and researching the secondary literature, because a lot of people can't go to the primary sources, or maybe the primary sources have been very thoroughly mined by a bunch of historians already, and there's not much point in going back. Um, or more often, the case is you can't spend five years doing that primary source research. Okay, so you're going to read the books, right? So what's wrong with going and reading the two, three books on a subject? On many subjects, there are only two or three books, if you're lucky, if that, right? So what are you missing if, if you just read those two or three books? Um, what you're missing, what we consider secondary source research. So I've talked a lot about how great primary source research is, how fundamental it is to sort of real research, right? Sometime in some context for some subjects, we just do the secondary source research, secondary source research part. Uh, for a, a full scale project, it, it's both, and you do both very thoroughly. But let's just talk about the secondary source research. The difference between reading a few books on a subject or all of the books that exist on a subject. All of that is still not what I would call secondary research. Research is not just reading the books and it's not just reading the books critically, it's mastering the literature. Those are the words we use in academia and you've probably heard it without it being properly explained to you what's actually meant by that. Um, what we mean by mastering the literature is not just reading the books what's out there. What you actually start with before you even do that is you need to kind of understand the landscape of what exists out there. Before you start diving into those books, okay, when were they written? Who were they written by? Uh, what was the purpose of their original writing? The kinds of questions you generally ask about primary sources. Uh, you ask them about secondary sources. So you're, one of the things you're going to find is that sometimes there's, let's say, say there's three books on a given subject in existence entirely, right? One may have been written in the 1830s, <laughs> uh, and it's really more of a primary source than anything else. One may have been written in the 1960s, and it was, you know, the height of scholarship at its time, but it is so outdated now. Um, and the sources that original author had access to were so limited compared to what's available now, that if there's also a book written in say 1995, that just went back and did all the things that you couldn't do in 1960, there's not much point in reading the book and written in 1960. And it's okay to maybe look at it and, and not do much more with that. And historians do that a lot of times. I'm not saying the key to this is to read every book. Um, that's often not the case. And if it's a subject like, let's say Abraham Lincoln, where there's just like, thousands of books on the subject, right? Way too many, just the strict biographies. I, there's gotta be at least a hundred, I'm assuming maybe a couple hundred, uh, let alone on Lincoln in, in other ways, not just biographies. Wow, lots and lots of stuff, scholarly and popular, tons. Of course, you're not gonna read all of that. So what you need to do first is sort of sort out what are what kinds of things are like maybe too out of date to even be useful. What kinds of things are written entirely to popularize for a general audience what others have, have written in a more thorough, maybe less readable, more thorough way with footnotes. You wanna go back to the thing with footnotes because you need to know where they got their information from in order to judge it um, or to use it or apply it. You need to know where it came from. So you're gonna skip the popular version that is for a, a casual interest, right? That where someone who doesn't want to spend that much time on it, they just want the basics. That book has a purpose and a use and it can be very good. And a lot of those are very good. I read lots of those things on subjects I have casual interest in like Abraham Lincoln for that matter. Um, but if you're gonna do something more than that, like you're creating content yourself about Abraham Lincoln, you're gonna have to go behind that, that casual stuff, right? You're gonna have to go to some of those original ones. So you wanna find out first, your first kind of layer is to sort out not what's crap, what's good. It's not that simple, but what's kind of got a different audience, what has a different purpose than what you're looking for. Um, and you're gonna narrow things down to what, what's really what you want to. And then what aspect of Lincoln are you interested in? You're gonna then you know, narrow it down by that as well. Um, then you also need to think about, okay, not just when something was written in terms of, was it out of date or is it current? In history, a lot of the sources I read, secondary sources that are very important were written in say the 60s or the 1930s or even in the 19th century. They can still be important. And in my field, a lot of times that's the most recent thing there is. Um, it's not uncommon at all. So I actually use those kinds of things. It's not entirely just about something superseding something else. Occasionally that happens. A lot of times it doesn't. Um, but when you think about when something was written, 
a book about Abraham Lincoln written in say the 1960s is going to tell us as much about the 1960s as it's gonna tell us about the 1860s about Lincoln um, because the context in which it was written informs the writing of the book. Not necessarily get in a bad way of just saying it's bias and dismiss it. Okay, therefore we can't read it. No, 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 no. We read it, we just read it understanding the context that to write about Abraham Lincoln in the 1960s to do that, to be interested in doing that, means you're going to want to look for certain aspects of Lincoln that are interesting to the concerns of the 1960s. And that means they're gonna not notice other stuff that we might be more interested in now. Um, that is the nature of the whole project. So what you have to do is go in conscious, aware of, of those distinctions and of that sort of nature of the project. And so you're gonna read something that was written in the 1960s realizing that they're look for what's not talked about <laughs> um, and maybe have to go find that somewhere else. And maybe there's going to be gaps where you will have to go back to primary sources because nobody's paid attention to that aspect before because it didn't, didn't interest anybody until then or it just sort of wasn't on the radar um, until later. And now it's suddenly on our radar. And a lot of history is rediscovering historical work, is rediscovering aspects of primary sources that you know have we've had access to for a long time but looking at them from different perspectives and asking different questions because our interests have changed now and our work on that will very much reflect our time and our interests, right? Um, so you have to do research with an awareness of the original intent and audience of the work, what kind of purposes it's gonna serve, what kind it's not, but also um, the time and place in which it was written in perspective of the author. Um, if there's a historian, most academic historians are their perspective is to further the academic project and they're trained to very much focus on that. So their perspective is going to be academic goals, which means they might ignore a lot of personal life. Anything written before the late 1960s and honestly more like the 90s, you're gonna get women ignored, for example, low status people of any kind ignored <laughs> um, because that's what historical interest, academic interest was at the time. That is not okay. <laughs> and it has completely changed. And a lot of what we do now is to go back and find that <laughs> and, and not just restore it to the record, but see how the record, the master narrative, the story of the past itself completely changes once we notice there are other people around and they're doing stuff too, right? They also have agency, they contribute to the world. Um, and so we're having to rewrite things to understand that. Um, so when you're looking at a literature, you're gonna wanna notice what's not there. You may find gaps where you need to go further back, maybe into the primary sources to even understand what's not being written about. Um, but you're also, every once in a while, you're gonna get not just sort of a general academic perspective, which you know, given in a certain time and place might've excluded women, there was gonna be much more focused on social history and women and people of color and others so we'll call subalterns, people who have less power um, is where our focus is today, um, most of the time. Um, but you're also going to think about, you know, some historians will have a very strong Marxist perspective, for example. Sometimes they're Marxist in the sense that they are writing history to contribute to our understanding of the working class, to raise class consciousness, to start a revolution. <laughs> um, but a lot of Marxist historians are not actually like revolutionaries. A lot of Marxist historians are following Marx, who is also himself a historian, by the way, they're following Marx's history, which is that economics drive almost everything. Um, in societies. And so they're, they're very sort of economic determinists. Um, that can be described as Marxist. Um, but generally speaking, when we talk about Marxists, we're also talking about people who are, who are politically very left-wing. Um, you can find political perspectives definitely coloring a lot of histories. In my field, you're looking at Eastern Europe. Oh my God. If you're talking about Eastern Europe in the 20th century and you have an Eastern European author, you very much have to pay attention to where that person is coming from politically, ideologically, uh, uh, nationally speaking. Um, and that, that's gonna, it just informs how you read it. It doesn't mean you dismiss something. A source is a source. You have to read them all in order to understand what's going on. But you are gonna read it through a certain lens, understanding sort of what the priorities are, what might not be getting talked about. And again, have to go somewhere else, whether it's other secondary literature or sometimes going back to the original primary sources to, to fill in those gaps. Um, so when you're mastering a literature, what you're doing is figuring out what's out there, but also why it's out there, what purpose does it serve, how is it written, how would that inform what's included, what's not, how the narrative is going to be constructed in order to pursue a certain goal. Most of the time, looking at academic history, the goal is just to understand the evidence, but people have different methodological sort of uh, priors. Um, some people are um, much more interested in experience um, and historical experiences, what was life like 
uh, than uh, sort of answering the bigger questions. And you're going to get different kinds of, of information, literally included, but also different ways of looking at information. Um, and that's just sort of a, a really, really basic, broad one. Um, there's lots and lots of methodological differences that will inform differences in interpretation. So you don't have, it's not just that you have to read differing interpretations and notice where they disagree. That's just like step half, not even step one. Um, you have to understand how every single part of the narrative is constructed by these perspectives and goals. And that doesn't make it dismissible or false or bad. It means this is how you should read this and how you should read it in context of other things. In other words, this is complicated. You're starting to see why it takes maybe 10 years to get really good at this. This is not something you just pick up a couple books and, and do the equivalent. It's really not. And that may be why your podcast should invite someone with the actual training specific to the subject you're talking about, not just in general, um, which means I have to do a whole other video about specialties. Um, so I'm gonna leave it here for now. I think I've done enough <laughs> for one video anyway, that's gone on long enough, um, but this will connect to lots of other things I'm gonna talk about as well. So thank you so much for listening. Remember, this is just me talking. I don't represent anyone or anything else. Um, I think most historians would agree with the things I've said here, but I'm sure a few wouldn't. So listen to other historians as well. Thank you so much. Don't forget to do the YouTube uh, stuff. Thanks. <laughs>